Um, there's no doubt that we're all a little bit holier today by who we're going to listen to next. Um, in just a few minutes, it is our distinct pleasure where we're going to have the opportunity to hear. A lot of people came to hear today, and that is his eminence, Raymond Leo Cardinal Burke. And when you've accomplished as much as he has, of course, by God's grace, um, you know, this, there's like 10 pages of his resume right here. <laughs> Try to, he's such a humble man, I'm not going to make him sit through all of his accomplishments. But there are some things that are so important to understand who we have with us today why his message is so important, and more importantly, how it can and should affect our lives, not only today, but moving forward. Um, he was born and raised in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Very humble beginnings. He was the youngest of six. I was teasing him just a little bit in a respectful way about what it was like being the youngest of six. All of you big families understand that that's about fighting and kind of fending for yourself. I think it prepared him for the future that he chose and that God chose for him in regards to fighting and defending things, specifically here, our faith. Um, he later attended Holy Cross Seminary. It was a high school in La Crosse. Grew up going to Catholic school, and it was interesting reading his autobiography uh, because he still remembers how important Catholic schooling was to him growing up and the examples that his parents, specifically mom, set for him growing up into his later years. He later attended Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. Uh, he prepared for ordination to the Holy Priesthood at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. He was later ordained a priest in 1975 at the Basilica of St. Peter in Rome by Pope Paul VI. A few years later, he was busy studying canon law at the same university. In 1989, Pope John Paul II named him Defender of the Bond of the Supreme Tribunal of the Apostolic Signatura. I didn't have enough time with him one-on-one -on -one to find out exactly what those duties included, but doesn't that sound powerful? <laughs> Coming from the Pope, I'd put that next to my name any day of the week. Uh, Pope John Paul II then named him Bishop of La Crosse, Wisconsin, the same town that he grew up in. Very interesting there, and that's where he also founded the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe. After serving there, later it was time for him to move on in 2004, where he was installed as the Archbishop of St. Louis. And a lot of people really started to hear his name there as well, and the work that he was trying to do in that community. While in St. Louis, also very important to note, that he created an altar dedicated to the most sacred heart of Jesus. More recently, in 2008, His Holiness, Pope Benedict appointed Archbishop Burke Prefect of the Supreme Tribunal of the Apostolic Signatura. Then on November 20th of 2010, His Holiness, Pope Benedict, elevated him to the College of Cardinals of the Holy Roman Church. After his elevation to the College of Cardinal of the Holy Roman Church, His Holiness appointed Cardinal Burke as a member of the Congregation for bishops, the Congregation for Divine Worship, and the Discipline of the Sacraments, and member of the Pontifical Council for Legislative Text. And then in January of 2011, His Holiness appointed Cardinal Burke as a member of the Council of Cardinals and Bishops of the Section for Relations with States of the Secretariat of State. Now, in addition to serving as the Prefect of the Supreme Tribunal of the Apostolic Signature, Cardinal Burke also serves on the Congregation for Bishops which you'll hear and see a lot of work being done, the Pontifical Council for Legislative Text, and of course the Congregation for Divine Worship, and the Discipline of the Sacraments, and the Council of Cardinals and Bishops of the Section for Relations with the States, again, of the Secretary of State. Um, it is our distinct honor to now welcome Cardinal Burke. Thank you, Vic, very much for a very generous introduction. I want to thank in a particular way Barbara Middleton and all of those who work with her in the Holy Trinity Apostolate for the 
opportunity to speak today uh, about the teaching on Christian martyrdom of the servant of God, Father John Anthony Harden of the Society of Jesus. I've known the Holy Trinity Apostolate for many, many years. In fact, the first time that I attended a, a meeting at which the Holy Trinity Apostolate was very much involved, it was together with the servant of God, Father Harden, with whom I was blessed to work in his last years. A great, wonderful gift that God gave to me. But I want to express my deepest esteem uh, for the work of the Holy Trinity Apostolate, and most especially for the annual Lenten Symposium. And we all owe Barbara and all of those who work with her a very deep debt of gratitude. Those who were privileged to work with the servant of God, Father John Anthony Hardin of the Society of Jesus, to hear him speak or to read his spiritual works, know his strong conviction that Catholics today, like the early Christians, must be ready to give a strong witness to their faith in its integrity, even to the shedding of blood. I think, for instance, of the Marian Catechist Manual, the Servant of God's last publication, for which I was honored to write the preface. In setting forth the nature and structure of the Marian Catechist Apostolate, one of the several apostolates which the Servant of God founded or cooperated in founding, Father Hardin wrote, Catholicism is in the throes of the worst crisis in its entire history unless true and loyal Catholics have the zeal and the spirit of the early Christians, unless they are willing to do what they did and to pay the price that they paid, the days of America are numbered. The servant of God was deeply conscious of the virulent secularization of society in the United States of America a secularization which has also entered into the church. He knew that the only way to transform the society, that is to turn the society around to Christ and his holy church, is for individual Catholics to live their faith with complete integrity, also in the face of loneliness, ridicule, persecution, and even death. In a particular way, he knew that such a strong Catholic witness depends essentially upon the right understanding of the faith and its demands, which is provided by sound catechesis. He saw how decades of a thin and even false catechesis had created a situation in which many Catholics were illiterate, illiterate regarding the faith. He saw how many were left in confusion and error regarding the most fundamental tenets of the Catholic faith and the moral law. Faith in the real presence of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist had dramatically diminished, resulting also in a practically total loss of Eucharistic devotion. Sunday Mass was no longer seen as a serious obligation under pain of mortal sin. And a regular access to the sacrament of penance was abandoned by great numbers of Catholics. A lack of formation in the virtues and general confusion and error regarding the moral law was yielding destruction and death in the lives of individuals and of families. Parents and even parish priests no longer saw catechesis as their principal responsibility toward their children. As a result, many children and young people were going down a path of sin and moral corruption without anyone correcting them or showing them the way of Christ, the way of truth and love. The only answer to the grave situation threatening the present and the future of our society, Father Hardin reminded us, 
is God. God who put us here at this time and place, knowing full well the gravity of our times, and his grace, which is available in superabundance. Regarding the life of the members of the Marian Catechist Apostolate, Father Hardin wrote, the Marian Catechist must have the zeal and desire to be part of this brilliant renaissance of a new way of life dedicated to filling the massive void caused by formerly faithful religious nuns and brothers who have abandoned their teaching vocation by the tens of thousands. The servant of God invited all who would read the Marian Catechist Manual to reflect upon the urgent need of catechists and to take up the apostolate. As he observed, engaging in the apostolate of catechesis does not require, require a Catholic to leave his profession, quit his job, or move to a new location, but to devote himself to the spiritual and doctrinal formation required of one called to witness to the faith in our time. He reminded his reader of how the first Christians nourished themselves through frequent reception of Holy Communion and through their meetings in the catacombs, which constituted a kind of school for them to gain the knowledge and build the cunning and the zeal to win souls for Christ. He urged today's Catholics to participate in Holy Mass and receive Holy Communion daily if possible. He also urged them to make their homes and their automobiles a school to instill knowledge and strength of will to evangelize. In other words, not to lose any occasion, even the time spent in traveling from one place to the other in our automobile to deepen one's understanding of the faith. Witness and martyrdom and the new evangelization. The witness of catechesis in the home, in travel, in work, in business, in the professions, in whatever arena of human endeavor a Catholic is involved, is a preeminent form of witness, which Catholics are called to give at all times, especially in the critical times in which we live. The constant witness, of which catechesis is a most important part, involves martyrdom, as the servant of God frequently reminded us. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, in fact, treats in two successive numbers the duty of, ca of Christians to witness to the faith and the supreme witness of martyrdom. Regarding the duty of witness to the faith, the Catechism of the Catholic Church declares, the duty of Christians to take part in the life of the Church impels them to act as witnesses of the Gospel and of the obligations that flow from it. This witness is a transmission of the faith in words and deeds. Witness is an act of justice that establishes the truth and makes it known. Regarding martyrdom, the following number, the Catechism of the Catholic Church declares, martyrdom is the supreme witness given to the truth of the faith it means bearing witness even unto death. The martyr bears witness to Christ who died and rose, to whom he is united by charity. He bears witness to the truth of the faith and of Christian doctrine. He endures death through an act of fortitude. Father Hardin developed his teaching on martyrdom to show the essential relationship of all forms of Christian witness to martyrdom. A study of the servant of God's teaching will show how all witness involves a certain dying to self, a certain oblation of self to Christ for the sake of his saving work. In its highest expression, 
It involves the pouring out of one's life blood in fidelity to Christ and his church. Blessed Pope John Paul II talked about the witness of Catholics so desperately needed on our time as the new evangelization, that is, teaching the Catholic faith, celebrating the Catholic faith by means of the sacraments and prayer, and living the Catholic faith in every circumstance of life. To remedy the situation of our time, of the complete secularization of society, the saintly pontiff, pontiff observed, a mending of the Christian fabric of society is urgently needed in all parts of the world. He hastened to add that if the remedy is to be achieved, the church herself must take up the gospel anew with the engagement and the energy of the first Christians and of the first missionaries to our part of the world. Fundamental to understanding the radical secularization of our culture is to understand how much the secularization has entered into the life of the church herself. In the words of Pope John Paul II, but for this mending of the Christian fabric of society to come about, what is needed is to first remake the Christian fabric of the ecclesial community itself present in these countries and nations. How true these words are. What a difference it would make in our nation if the fabric of the life of the church, of, the, of all of the communities of the church, of the Catholic church in our nation were engaged in the new evangelization. The Roman pontiff therefore called upon the lay faithful to fulfill their particular responsibility, that is, to testify how the Christian faith constitutes the only fully valid response consciously perceived and stated by all in varying degrees to the problems and the hopes that life poses to every person and society. Making more specific the call, he clarified that the fulfillment of the responsibility of the lay faithful requires that they know how to overcome in themselves the separation of the gospel from life to take up again in their daily activities, in family, work, and society, an integrated approach to life that is fully brought about by the inspiration and the strength of the gospel. Brother Hardin saw his, his work completely united to this call of the new, to the new evangelization by blessed Pope John Paul II. Before the challenges of living the Catholic faith in our time, Blessed Pope John Paul II recalled to our minds the urgency of Christ's mandate given to his first disciples and given to missionaries, no, given no less, to missionaries down the Christian centuries and to us today. He declared, certainly the command of Jesus, go and preach the gospel, always maintains its vital value and its ever-pressing obligation. Nevertheless, the present situation, not only of the world, but also of many parts of the church, absolutely demands that the word of Christ receive a more ready and generous obedience. Every disciple is personally called by name, no disciple can withhold making a response. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Christians today often find themselves in a society and culture which does not know God, is forgetful of him, or even hostile to him and his law written in creation and inscribed upon every human heart. In such a situation, the clear and courageous witness of the Christian life, 
giving glory to God by obedience to his law written upon the human heart is more critically needed than ever, not only for the sake of the salvation of the individual Christian soul, but also for the transformation of the culture and society so that it may truly foster and develop the good of all. The obedience which is fundamental and essential to the new evangelization is also a virtue acquired with great difficulty in a culture which exalts individualism and questions all authority except the self. Yet it is indispensable if the gospel is to be taught and lived in our time. We must take the example from the first disciples, from the first missionaries to our homeland, and from the hosts of saints and blesseds who gave themselves completely to Christ, calling upon the help and the guidance of the Holy Spirit to purify themselves of any rebellion before God and to strengthen them to do God's will in all things. The servant of God, Father John Anthony Hardin, took up the work of the new evangelization faithfully and tirelessly. It was his one desire to assist his brothers and sisters in the church to teach, celebrate, and live the Catholic faith with the enthusiasm and energy of the first disciples, of the great saints like St. Ignatius of Loyola, and of the missionaries who first brought the Catholic faith to our land. He expressed the call to the new evangelization most fittingly as a call to witness and ultimately to martyrdom. So many faithful, including myself, continue to follow the inspiration and direction which the servant of God gave to us. The font of the new evangelization and of martyrdom. Before reflecting on the details of Father Hardin's teaching on witness and martyrdom, we must first ask, what is the source of the witness which we have received from the servant of God, Father John Hardin, and of the martyrdom which he proposes to us? The answer is quite simple, as blessed John Paul II taught us. The source is a person, our Lord Jesus Christ, alive in his mystical body, the Church. There was never any doubt in Father Hardin's mind that he belonged totally to Christ, who had called him to the priesthood and through the ministry of the bishop who ordained him to the priesthood and through the ministry of the bishop ordained him to the priesthood. He desired only one thing in his life, that is to remain faithful to Jesus Christ, also if such fidelity would demand a martyr's death. In the sermon which he preached on June 18, 1997, the 50th anniversary of his priesthood ordination and his 83rd birthday, the sermon in which, if I'm not mistaken, was preached at Assumption Grotto in the Archdiocese of Detroit, Father Hardin described his entire priestly life as the struggle to be faithful to our Lord Jesus Christ. He declared, I could talk, not for hours or days, but months, on what I've learned during my 50 years in the priesthood. Only God knows the price I have paid to try to be faithful to Jesus Christ. But what an important adversative, but. I share this with you from the depths of my heart. I've also learned to trust in Jesus Christ, to hope in his grace, in a word, to be confident. Father Hardin's words communicate the humility of one who desires to serve his divine master with all his being, even though he is conscious of his weaknesses. 
The servant of God humbly speaks of trying to be faithful, of the struggle to be faithful. At the same time, his words express the confidence of one who is living in deep communion with his master, trusting that notwithstanding the forces from within and the forces from without, which try to discourage and derail our efforts to be faithful, Christ accompanies us and gives us the grace to be faithful. At the conclusion of the same homily, the servant of God pleaded for priests that priests may be priests not only in name but in reality. He described what he called a real priest with these words. A real priest is one who loves Jesus crucified. A real priest is one who loves nothing more, and I mean every syllable, who loves nothing more than to suffer out of love for Jesus who ordained him. A real priest is a living martyr. Father Hardin went on to speak about the temptations against the faith and temptations against chastity which assail priests and which would hinder them in fidelity to their mission to be the channels of the grace of faith to those who depend on their priestly ministry. The servant of God concluded his requests of prayers for priests by speaking about his own prayer. And I quote from his first mass at every consecration for the grace of martyrdom. He then pleaded, pray that we priests, if it is God's grace, die a martyr's death that we might live all of us, a martyr's life. From the words of Father Hardin, it is clear that in accord with the teaching of the church, being a priest means being totally for Christ, a steadfastly faithful witness to Christ, who is present to his church as head of his body, shepherd of his flock, high priest of the redemptive sacrifice, teacher of truth. The priest, by the grace of holy orders, acts in the person of Christ the head, in persona Christi Capitis. Rightly then, the ordained priest prays daily for the grace to be always a white martyr and to be ready to be a red martyr should fidelity to Christ require it. The Society of Jesus and Martyrdom. The second major font of the servant of God's faithful and steadfast witness was the formation of his mind and heart in the Society of Jesus. Father Hardin understood deeply the meaning of the name of his religious community, the Society of Jesus, namely a body of men united unconditionally in love of Jesus Christ and therefore forming a core at the service of Christ in accord with the directives of the Roman pontiff, the vicar of Christ on earth. It should be noted that St. Ignatius of Loyola and, Loyola and his first companions identified themselves as the Compagnia di Jesus, which was translated into Latin so, so, societas Jesu, and in English, the Society of Jesus. A more literal translation in English, the Company of Jesus, underlines perhaps better the intimacy of the communion with the Master, which the members sought from the first days of the foundation. St. Ignatius of Loyola, founder of the Society of Jesus, proposed for his followers a total dedication to the mission of Christ rooted in a contemplation of the mystery of Christ, God the Son, the second person of the Holy Trinity, made man incarnate. The spirituality of the Society of Jesus as handed down from St. Ignatius of Loyola is founded on the communion with our Lord Jesus Christ by which we, with him, and in the grace of the Holy Spirit, 
give glory to God the Father. Hence the motto of the Jesuits, ad maiorem dei gloriam, to the greater glory of God. The Christian, as St. Ignatius experienced in a profound way in his own life, is called to a daily, a constant conversion to Christ to become a new man in Christ. The spirituality of St. Ignatius of Loyola embodies a deeply personal knowledge and love of Jesus Christ, through, with, and in whom one comes to know God the Father, to love him and to serve him. Communion with our Lord Jesus Christ in the knowledge, love, and service of the Father means giving ourselves always more in love, loving to the end as Christ loves. The metaphor of the Christian as a soldier of Christ, a miles Christi, is most apt, for the Christian dedicates himself totally to Christ ready to lay down his life for Christ and his mystical body, the Church. It is a spirituality which inspires the desire and effective action of always giving the greater glory to God the Father. Father Hardin was tireless in the apostolate because it was Jesus Christ himself to whom he was giving himself in loving service. Communion with our Lord Jesus Christ for St. Ignatius of Loyola meant ready service of his vicar on earth, the Roman pontiff. In discerning God's will and looking for the signs of God, St. Ignatius bound himself and his brothers in the Society of Jesus to the service of the Roman pontiff as the supreme shepherd of the flock. There is no question that Father Hardin wanted all of his service of the apostolate to be in the strictest communion with the Roman pontiff. Otherwise, as he understood, it would no longer be service of Christ in his church. In his autobiography, St. Ignatius of Loyola, in recounting the story of his conversion, tells of a vision in which he saw clearly an image of Our Lady with the Holy Child Jesus. The vision of the Mother of God inspired his conversion to Christ. Regarding the vision, his autobiography attests, from this sight he received for a considerable time very great consolation, and he was left such and he was left such loathing for his whole past life, and especially for the things of the flesh, that it seemed to him that his spirit was rid of all the images that had been painted on it. Thus from that hour until when this was written, he never gave the slightest consent to the things of the flesh. For this reason, it may be considered the work of God, although he did not dare to claim it nor said more than to affirm the above. But his brothers, as well as all of the rest of the household, came to know from his exterior, the change which had been wrought inwardly in his soul. After his conversion and after he was well enough to travel again, he set out, out on his pilgrimage to Jerusalem, going first to the shrine of Our Lady at Montserrat near Barcelona, at which he made his general confession. And on the eve of the Annunciation of Our Lord, he gave up his fine clothing to a beggar and clothed himself in the sackcloth tunic and sandals of a pilgrim. I quote from his autobiography, that night he went to Our Lady's altar and following the rites of chivalry, he spent the evening in a vigil of arms, kneeling and standing the whole night through. At dawn, he offered his sword and dagger to Our Lady hanging them on the chapel wall. Ignatius of Loyola was now Our Lady's Knight. Wanting to give himself completely to Jesus Christ, God the Son incarnate, Saint Ignatius turned to the Mother of God, seeking her intercession that he might give up his life as a worldly soldier 
to become her soldier in the unconditional service of her divine son. Likewise, St. Ignatius attests to his constant prayer to the Blessed Virgin Mary from the time of his priestly ordination that she intercede for him to unite him with her son. After his priestly ordination, St. Ignatius, in fact, spent an entire year without saying Mass, preparing himself and praying Our Lady to deign to place him with her son. In the whole life and spirituality of St. Ignatius, devotion to the Mother of God is seen as the way to knowledge and love of her divine Son. Given, given totally to our Lord Jesus Christ, St. Ignatius invoked unceasingly the intercession of the Mother of the Savior and sought to follow her in the total union of his heart with the glorious pierced heart of Jesus. For the members of the Society of Jesus, communion with our Lord Jesus Christ necessarily comes by way of the Mother of God, of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who gave birth to God the Son at Bethlehem and unfailingly draws all men to her divine Son in the Church with the instruction which she gave to the wine stewards at the wedding feast of Cana when she directed them in their need to go to her Son saying, do whatever he tells you. Martyrdom according to the servant of God, Father Hardin. The greatest spiritual legacy of the servant of God, Father Hardin, is a life lived in Jesus Christ for the greater glory of God. Even as in his own priestly life, he sought to know, love, and serve Jesus Christ alone, so also he taught others to do the same in accord with the, the demands of their vocation and life. Observing the great confusion and error also within the church in the present time, Father Hardin frequently reminded all of the faithful that they must prepare themselves to suffer greatly, even to undergo martyrdom, in order to be faithful to the teaching of Christ and his church. Father Hardin remained confident in the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit, although he saw clearly the gravity of the situation and the greatness of the demands of the Christian life in our time, he was confident that with the grace of Christ, Catholics would give the faithful witness to Christ, which transforms individual lives and, the, and indeed the world. The Servant of God provides us a systematic presentation of his teaching on martyrdom in his book, Holiness in the Church, reprinted in the year 2000 by Eternal Life, the apostolate he founded with the saintly layman, Mr. William Smith of Bardstown, Kentucky. First of all, Father Hardin grounds his teaching on martyrdom on the words of our Lord before he ascended to the right hand of the Father. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and then you will be my witnesses not only in Jerusalem, but throughout Judea and Samaria, and indeed to the ends of the earth. The words of our Lord teach us the source, the nature, and the apostolic purpose of martyrdom. The source of the strength to suffer for Christ comes finally from the Holy Spirit, who is said to give power. As Blessed John Paul II reminded us, it is the life of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us through the sacraments of baptism and confirmation, which inspires within us holiness of life, the strength to suffer for the love of Christ. The Holy Spirit dwelling within our souls enables us to testify to the truth which Christ teaches us in his holy church. Martyrdom is an essential expression of our personal relationship with Christ. It is, in fact, the personal relationship with Christ which gives the witness or martyr joy in his suffering. In the words of the servant of God, in fact, one of the paradoxes of martyrdom 
is the positive happiness that a strongly committed follower of Christ has in suffering for Christ. Brother Hardin refers to the account in the Acts of the Apostles of the flogging of the apostles after being warned not to speak any longer in the name of Jesus. The sacred writer tells us that the apostles were glad to have had the honor of suffering humiliation for the sake of the name of Jesus. Father Hardin, observing that martyrdom is no academic theory, but a palpable fact of every true Christian, of every true follower of Christ, distinguishes three forms of martyrdom, of being witnesses of Christ before the whole world. They are the martyrdom of blood, the martyrdom of persecution, and the martyrdom of witness. The martyrdom of blood, as the Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches us, is the supreme witness given to the truth of the faith. Before the choice of either betraying Christ or dying for Christ, the martyr of blood remains faithful and pours out his life for love of Christ. We immediately think of the many martyrs among the first Christians, beginning with St. Stephen, and also the martyrs down the centuries, for example, St. Peter Verona, St. Thomas a Becket, St. Boniface, Saints Thomas More and John Fisher, the North American martyrs, St. Paul Miki and his companions, the martyrs of Japan, St. Andrew Kim and his companions, the martyrs of Korea, St. Charles Luanga and his companions, the martyrs of Uganda, and a host of others. Father Hardin reminds us of the many martyrs of blood in our own time who join with Christ in expiation of the enormity of today's sins and in an urgent plea for God's mercy. Father Hardin also reminds us that the martyrs of blood uniting their suffering and dying to the suffering and death of Christ, apply the fruits of the, wor of the, of the fruits of the world's, and the fruits of the death of Christ, of the fruits of the world's redemption to, the, to, to a sinful human race. He concludes, one thing we dare not forget is that these present-day martyrs are our fellow members of the mystical body. Through their sufferings, we are all made richer, as through their merits, the whole church becomes more holy. The second form of martyrdom is the martyrdom of persecution or of opposition. <coughs> Excuse me. Through the martyrdom of persecution, the faithful suffer greatly, even though their suffering does not end in violent death. One thinks, for instance, of the suffering of so many Christians under the various communist regimes of our time. Sometimes these martyrs of persecution spent years in prison in Siberia or Vietnam. The servant of God reminds us that many martyrs of persecution are ostensibly free to walk the streets and live in a home, but they are deprived of every human liberty to practice their religion and to serve Christ according to their faith. One cannot help but think of the current situation in our own nation. A totally secularist government makes legal and even promotes the most grievous violations of the moral law, for example, procured abortion, euthanasia, so-called same-sex marriage, human cloning and the wholesale destruction of human embryos for the sake of research, and now is trying to force Catholics and other persons of good will, of good conscience, to cooperate formally in such acts to the total violation of their conscience. 
Catholics are called today in the United States of America more than ever, even if it means loss of goods, to stand up for the truth which Christ teaches us. Yes, even if it means the loss of goods, government harassment, and even imprisonment. I think, for instance, of the threat of the loss of tax exemption with its disastrous effects on many apostolates of the church, which may be the necessary result of holding true to our faith and the moral law. We can do nothing less than to hold true to our Lord Jesus Christ and to the truth which he hands, us on, hands on to us in the Holy Church, no matter what may be the results, the suffering, the opposition which we will face. Father Hardin illustrates the nature of the martyrdom of persecution or opposition through a text of the Book of Wisdom in chapter 2, verses 6 to 19. The text teaches us that there are two reasons why, why worldly people persecute those who are trying to serve God. First of all, the godless, as they are called, say to themselves with misguided reasoning that all they have to look for is what this world offers them. The text from the Book of Wisdom reads, Come then, let us enjoy what good things are, what good things there are. Use this creation with the zest of youth. Let none of us forego his part in our orgy. Let us leave the signs of our reveling everywhere. Secondly, they turn their attention to the faithful believers who are a standing rebuke to the godless. The text of the Book of Wisdom reads, As for the virtuous man who is poor, let us oppress him. Let us not spare the widow, nor respect old age, white-haired with many years. Let our strength be the yardstick of virtue, since weakness argues its own futility. Let us lie in wait for the virtuous man, since he annoys us and opposes our way of life, reproaches us for our breaches of the law, and accuses us of playing false to our upbringing. As the text makes clear, the follower of the truth written by God in every human heart will suffer persecution at the hands of those who prefer the immediate convenience and pleasure of lies even the grossest of lies. The suffering is greatly increased by the betrayal of the truth by those who claim to follow Christ and to be members of his church, even bishops, priests, and consecrated religious. Had it lost their former commitment to Christ. Brother Hardin describes the situation with these words. Here, the firm believer in the church's teaching authority, the devoted servant of the papacy, the convinced pastor who insists on sound doctrine to his flock, the dedicated religious who want to remain faithful to their vows of authentic poverty, honest chastity, and sincere obedience, the firm parents who are concerned about the religion and moral training of their children, the religious and moral training of their children, and are willing to sacrifice generously to build and care for a Christian family, natural or adopted, such persons will not be spared also active criticism and open opposition, but they, most especially, they, but they must especially be ready to live in an atmosphere of coldness to their deepest beliefs. Here the suffering all often comes from the studied indifference of people whom devout, the devout faithful know and love, of persons of their own natural or religious family, of men and women whose intelligence they respect and whose respect they cherish. 
In the words of Father Hardin, the martyrdom of witness lies in the deprivation of good example to us on the part of our contemporaries and is the practice of Christian virtue in loneliness because those who witness what we do are in the majority numerically or psychologically and we know that they are being embarrassed by the testimony. We witness to them indeed, but they are not pleased to witness who we are, what we stand for, what we say, or what we do. Such martyrdom is the daily witness offered by every faithful Catholic in a totally secularized society and in the church, which too suffers secularization. Father Hardin concludes by reminding us that the martyrdom of witness is by no means fruitless. He reminds us that while our witness will surely cost us greatly in human terms, God's grace is always active in the hearts of everyone whose path we cross. Even as the blood of martyrs has produced great increase in the church in every time and in every place, so too our daily faithful martyrdom of witness will not fail to bear great fruit for the transformation of our society. Referring to the early martyrs of the church, Father Hardin taught us, but their patience and meekness finally prevailed. Yes, but only because it was supported by unbounded courage. <laughs> Excuse me. Born not out of their own strength, but of the power that Christ promised to give all his followers that shall witness to his name everywhere. This promise is just as true today. All that we need is to trust in the spirit in whom we possess, whom we possess and never grow weary in giving testimony to the grace we have received. Let us never cease to implore our Lord for all the graces we need to be his faithful witnesses in the world, especially the grace of courage in paying the price of suffering for doing what is right and good. In his book, Spiritual Life in the Modern World, in which the servant of God sets forth in a clear way the meaning of our communion with Christ in his suffering, passion, and death, he quoted St. Ignatius, his father in God, about the need to ask God in prayer for sufferings in order that the love of God might grow in our hearts and be a sign for our brothers and sisters. Father Hardin then commented, the trouble with quotations like this from the mystics is that we are liable to think that they were unlike ourselves. Not so. They shrank from sacrifice and the cross as much as we do. But here precisely is the secret of sanctity. It is possible through divine grace for the love of God to reach a degree in our hearts where we experience joy in suffering. Honest, really. And it is a taste of this joy which the Savior promised to all who strives sincerely to become like him by embracing what he embraced, the cross. He out of love for his Father, we out of love for Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The cost of loving God is high, but God comes through. He rewards the price we pay with an experience of his presence, a sense of his intimacy, and a joy that the saints tell us is so sweet that they would not exchange their sufferings for all the pleasures in the world. Let us ask our Savior 
to not just listen or hear what those who love to tell, those who love, those who learn to love God tell us, but to teach us from experience that this great wisdom is true. The servant of God was realistic about the high price to be paid for remaining faithful to Christ, but at the same time, he was confident in the help of God's grace to make us wise and strong in paying the price, no matter how high, while also giving us the consolation of an ever deeper communion with Christ in his suffering and dying, which leads to his rising from the dead. It is my hope that these few reflections on Christian martyrdom and the thought of the servant of God for the John Anthony Hardin of the Society of Jesus are of some help to you in coming to a deeper knowledge of Christ and of our life in him and his holy church. In a particular way, I hope that they will inspire you to draw ever more fully upon the strong grace of the Lenten season in order to turn over your life more completely to Christ, to give your heart, one with the Immaculate Heart of Mary, more totally into the Sacred Heart of Jesus. May Our Lady of Guadalupe, Mother of America, and Star of the New Evangelization, to whom the servant of God turns so often in his prayers. And may the servant of God, Father John Hardin, intercede for us daily so that we may be daily true martyrs for the love of Christ and his mystical body, Holy Church. Thank you very much and God bless you all.